Um, our next speaker is Jason. You can hold your applause for later. Um, I just said to Auntie Muriel that um, she's taken up some of my 15 minutes, which is good. Because um, I've, in many respects, got one of the more unremarkable parts of this role at the moment, and that is um, well, working within, within government to try and um, enable government to uh, reorganise itself to understand what self-determination means for our Aboriginal community, um, and certainly what a treaty or a series of treaties may mean uh, for our Aboriginal communities. Uh, I should start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet here this evening and uh, pay my respects to um, all elders, both past and present, and to all other <coughs> Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the room. Um, and I generally start these forums um, by thanking um, members of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community for, um, um, for your resilience. Uh, determination, wisdom, guidance, support, um, tough love, which we can get in our community, um, but ultimately um, leadership. Um, and we hear these words many, time in our, many times in our communities and I think um, it's certainly the right thing and the respectful thing to do to acknowledge you know, the footprints of which we are following as younger Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I still put myself in the younger category. Um, uh, and the fingerprints that um, we're trying to leave um, uh, at our own point in time. And I don't say that for any other reason, but as I said, it's just the right thing to do. Um, and for anybody who has worked in the Aboriginal community um, would know the challenges that you're faced with on a daily basis, both professionally, uh, personally, culturally, socially. Um, it's an incredibly rewarding space to work in, but incredibly difficult. Uh, I'm in the third phase of my career. I spent the good part of 10 to 12 years working in the community controlled sector um, and at a very young age she'd seen the impact of um, a shift in government policy when uh, the federal government in the mid-90s decided to cut the community support funding for ATSIC, which was essentially the first blow to the knees of the community controlled sector uh, at the Commonwealth level and that essentially took out administrators, bookkeepers as they were known back then, and other administrative staff in our co-ops. And they were co-ops that people like my grandmother and great-grandmother and great-aunties and uncles sat around kitchen tables arguing about, fighting about, but ultimately building because of the inability for our community, for the Aboriginal community to access mainstream services at a fair and equitable level. Um, I went into a role at Gunijamara Aboriginal Co-op as a very young, green and naive CEO at a time where we had about 18 months of funding left. Subsequently, I left that role about five to six years later, having um, brought community together to look at what the next frontier for our Aboriginal community controlled sector would look like. And that is where the, sort of the birth of the Aboriginal health service, the Aboriginal medical services in South West Victoria had started. Um, and the realities of understanding the relationship between government and community and the power imbalance that sits between government and community was never more real to me than at that point in time. And Nani Muriel touched on the fact that essentially every two to three years, once you start to reorientate your rhythm, your strategy, your workforce, there would be a change in the rules again. Um, and it made, made it incredibly difficult to build the type of organisation that our community has great aspiration to build, and that's high performing, high functioning, delivering quality and impactful services in a whole range of different levels. I spent the next 10, or the last 10 years, essentially in the corporate world as the head of Aboriginal Affairs at the AFL, not without its challenges, very public. Um, and it really gave me a great insight into how institutions need to change the value proposition of their relationship with Aboriginal community. Um, and in many respects, the AFL is a really unique entity and and I have joked it's the second government that I've worked for in this state. Um, some would say the first. Um, the one I haven't worked for is the Herald Sun, but um, that, that, that may be gone by the time I'm ready to move into my th uh, fourth part of my career. Um, but when you talk about institutional reform and institutional change, 
there's a whole range of levers you need to pull, but ultimately um, it's the leadership and it's the attitude and it's the understanding of what a relationship actually means by way of prosperity. And in many respects, the AFL moved significantly from just measuring success by having the good part of 3% of the Australian population make up 10% of our elite players, but ultimately was significantly underperforming in terms of Aboriginal people in roles of governance, the general workforce, it's been 30 years since we've had an Aboriginal coach, an Aboriginal umpire. So in many respects, never fully understood, understood the, um, the relationship with the Aboriginal community and what it could do to the, the, the AFL on a broader context, not just by way of on-field, but certainly off-field. And when I was approached about uh, my interest in this role, um, being a non-public servant, um, my first two responses were thanks but no thanks. Um, um, but then, after a series of other discussions, I realised what the intention of the Premier was, and certainly the Minister, the Honourable Natalie Hutchins, um, and uh, the Department of Premier and Cabinet in terms of driving a legitimate reform process in and around self-determination, and ultimately wanting to test a community's aptitude or attitude towards treaty, initially through constitutional recognition, and on February 3, the Aboriginal community outright refuted the notion of accepting constitutional recognition um, without a treaty. And there's a lot of um, academics in the room and a lot of other people who will be better qualified than me, particularly constitutional lawyers, in regards to the sequencing of an agreement-making process or treaty or treaties versus constitutional recognition. Uh, and I know that's a great debate amongst particularly academics on which one should precede the other. But notwithstanding that, the community on February 3 um, made a really strong, loud call in terms of, you know, treaty was the conversation that they wanted to have with, um, with the, the current Victorian government. Um, in many respects, I started at the end of this process and I think uh, the exercise that we uh, have embarked on and certainly will continually embark on over the next couple of years is in many regards about resetting and renewing a relationship a relationship that was never negotiated upon settlement. Um, and I think it's this relationship both socially, culturally, environmentally, economically and certainly politically that this process will ultimately deliver success against both for the Victorian government and more particularly for the Aboriginal community. And I do have a saying that um, I've seen in all of my walks of life, um, that if the Aboriginal community win, the whole community win. And in many respects, the notion of a rising tide lifts all boats is never more true than in this situation here, given the power imbalance that there is between um, successive governments and the Aboriginal community. What I'm seeing through this process in the Aboriginal community is um, the reorganisation of our social order and our, <coughs> and our cultural order. Um, and that's incredibly empowering, it's incredibly challenging. Not everybody is in agreement. And after being frozen out of a conversation like this for so long, you wouldn't expect the Aboriginal community to be in furious agreement. Um, I think we all share a destination point, the process, um, not necessarily in furious agreement in and around that. People talk about um, treaty in a whole range of ways, and Aunty Muriel's um, articulated that beautifully tonight in a number of different ways, and I'm sure Sarah will do the same. But in many respects, um, it's about justice and it's about fairness. Um, it's about just doing what is right and what um, the successive governments of all persuasions haven't necessarily either understood to be right or had the courage to actually pursue this thing called an agreement-making process. People talk about what it actually means in reality. Um, the four things that I've largely summarised it to be is around rights and recognition. Any treaty needs to be based on the rights of our First Peoples. And the United Nations Declaration for Indigenous Rights is an international instrument that is guiding elements of this process that we're in at the moment. So rights around our, to practise our customs, to speak our languages, uh, recognition around past injustices, not by way of uh, any other means, but to move forward, you need to, we need to acknowledge what 
um, successive governments have failed to do over many, many generations. Uh, it's about representation. Um, no government's ever allowed the Aboriginal community to pick its own team. It's essentially always picked the team. Um, and I use a maybe bad a sporting analogy given my background. It's sort of like having two teams and one team to decide where they're going to play, when they're going to play, where they're going to play and who's going to be on the opposition. And there's no way knowing that that's fair on any measure. That is just so unfair. And that has been happening to the Aboriginal community for too long by successive governments. So the voice of the Aboriginal community to determine what representation looks like in a contemporary setting, um, who it is and how it's elected is a really important part of this process. Um, number three is around reparation. Reparation could be summarised in a whole range of different ways. Um, but essentially I would summarise it by way of an unnegotiated land settlement over 150, 160 years ago in this state. And if you look at the prosperity that's come out of this country, um, First Peoples country, the one segment of the community have been marginalised in that prosperity, prosperity is the Aboriginal community. Um, if there are any economists in the room, would welcome your views how we could develop a methodology to determine what reparation might look like. And the fourth point is around legally binding agreements. Unless it has legal entity, legal tenure, legal obligation, um, I, I think the Aboriginal community has seen um, a lot of MOUs um, in, its, in our lifetime um, between government, between corporations, between NGOs <laughs> and Aboriginal ACOs, etc., etc. So it needs to be legally binding. Um, the legal and technical aspects of what this process may or will ultimately deliver is a lot of work we've got to take advice on um, uh, and seek advice on. And people quite rightfully go to content. Um, we, in the current process, haven't moved towards content yet. Um, what we do know uh, um, that essentially until the Aboriginal community determine who is authorised and who is mandated to negotiate the content of a treaty, um, um, there's really nobody for the government to negotiate against with any authorisation of any, of any description. So uh, that's the process we're pursuing at the moment in terms of going out the community consultations talking about um, what does a contemporary representative structure look like and what's it mandated to do? Um, how do we nominate it? Who elects it? Um, uh, how do we put it into legislation so government of any persuasion just can't make a decision one day that it's um, becoming too powerful, therefore we'll minimise it? And there are all the learnings that we've taken, and many people in this room um, would understand those intimately for a whole range of different reasons. I'll just conclu conclude with, um, I guess, the aspiration uh, in this term of government <coughs> Uh, it's ambitious, and I think the Premier's been incredibly brave uh, in terms of stating his ambition. I've got no doubt um, that's equally supported by Minister Hutchins um, in terms of what the ambition um, in this term to get done. Um, and that's largely summarised by three things. And that's the potential to get a representative structure into legislation before the next election. Not the, not the nominations, not the appointments, but a representative structure. Um, the potential to get a treaty fund or a fund so the Aboriginal community have got its own economic base to work with post the next election. So you minimise the control that successive governments have had on Aboriginal community in terms of being able to manage its own affairs and building its own negotiation strategy and team to negotiate against government. And the third point is not a treaty, but it's an agreement-making framework and principles to essentially develop the rules of engagement for negotiation post the next election. Uh, if those three things are achievable, um, ultimately the Aboriginal community will be, will be empowered to then take the process through to the next point that it determines is the right point for them. The relationship at this stage is a um, is an interesting one. So we're encouraging self-determination, we're encouraging autonomy, but we're in this sort of transition phase. And in many respects, I was saying to Sarah earlier, it's sort of like um, playing a game of footy 
uh, with three teams and umpiring at the same time. Um, it's pretty dynamic, it's pretty complicated, um, but it's great fun. And um, when you talk about sort of headstone moments, you know, I think, you know, our generation, our community, including the people in the audience right now, are in one of those moments. That if this is, a, if this is something we can capture, I think, um, you know, our legacy will be one, be one that stands the test of time. Um, you know, for the generations that uh, will follow us, and when you consider 50% of the Aboriginal community in Victoria is under the age of 20, um, uh, in, the next, in the next 10 years that'll grow by at least another 10 to 15,000 people, um, both by way of migration and birth rates, um, there will be a day that we're not the invisible minority of which we might be at this point in time to many people in the Victorian community. And I think this process is a way of um, lifting not only Aboriginal aspiration, but the brand of Aboriginal Victorians that is now going back to some 80,000 years old as technology improves and enables us to measure that. Um, and that's a brand that all Victorians should have great pride in and be able to tell a story to. So in many respects, that's the resetting and renewing of a relationship. Thank you.